Shoulder my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Yes, my yoke is easy and my burden light. The Gospel of the Lord. Holy Scripture, like all good literature, is full of beautiful images which speak not just to our minds with abstract ideas, so to speak, but to the depths of our souls and our hearts. And many of the images, of course, we're very familiar with from Scripture, and we, as it were, find life in them. All of us, I'm sure, have found great comfort, for example, in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Beautiful image there, which invites us to see ourselves as rather silly, foolish sheep who are often wandering astray. But we have a shepherd who will from time to time just give us a little tap, a little crook, and make sure we go back to the green pastures, another beautiful image of the, the still waters. When we listen and hear these images, it kind of helps us to pray more deeply, the kind of images that we can take into our prayer, just turn into a prayer really, we can say, Shepherd, lead me to the green pastures, the still waters, I was going to say the green waters, that would not be a very good image, when we're tired, when we find it difficult to pray, these images really help us, but some of the images in scripture are not quite so familiar and need a bit of explanation, among them this one that Jesus himself uses in the Gospel when he speaks about having an easy yoke. What is he talking about? Apparently a yoke was a kind of a large curved beam of wood which went round the neck of the peasant, the labourer, and that the order of his bosses, no doubt, he would have to use this beam to attach various heavy weights that he had to lift from one place to another, back-breaking work in the heat of the sun all day long. And it's, it's that that Jesus is contrasting his yoke with. In other words, it's a very powerful, very quite subtle image, really. He is saying, yes, following me does involve a certain amount of effort. It's true. You have to get up and pray in the morning, pray, go to Mass every Sunday, say your prayers, keep my commandments, especially the commandment of love, do all the things that a Christian is supposed to do, go to confession from time to time. Yes, you should do these things. And there is a certain amount of effort or burden, but it's not meant to be burdensome. It's not meant to be heavy. It's not meant to be something that makes you sad and miserable. A great contradiction when we see Catholics who are somehow weighed down by all the demands that they think their faith involves. I've got to do this prayer, I've got to say that, I must get my rosary in, I've got to do this, I'm not a good enough Catholic. No, says Jesus. Do your best with my grace, but above all, it's my grace that will help you. And I think he's thinking when he talks about an easy burden or light burden, he's contrasting it on the one hand with the kind of burdens that the Pharisees and religious leaders of the time bloated on people, hundreds and hundreds of petty regulations. They had expanded the Ten Commandments, which in themselves are quite simple, into hundreds and thousands of rules. You mustn't do this on the Sabbath, you mustn't do this, you can do this, but you can't do this. And these have become a burden for people, so much so that when Jesus, on one occasion we were told, looked at the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, burdened down by these ridiculous rules. And Catholics can suffer from the same kind of syndrome, or even just as human beings, we can feel we're not quite good enough. I remember in the, I think it was in the 1970s when all the books were coming out as to about family life and how parents can uh, so easily mess their children up if they don't do this and do that, and they shouldn't do this, they shouldn't say this. And a book came out by a well-known psychologist with a wonderful title, A Good Enough Parent. A Good Enough Parent. 
that. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be good enough to launch your children onto the adventure of life. Now, I don't suppose we'd want to call ourselves good enough Christians, but we, because we are indeed called to holiness, we're called to do great things. But nevertheless, we're not called to do them by our own effort, as if it's all some terrible burden for us. We're called to rely on the grace of God, who gives us his grace in the sacraments, especially the Eucharist and confession, and helps us to live the kind of way he wants. But there's another kind of burden, I think, that Jesus may have in mind, that the spiritual writers of the church frequently speak about. And that really is the burden of our own desires and passions. We have this wonderful image, don't we, or myth, that somehow if we can only just get rid of all the demands of the law and things that other people tell us and just do our own thing, go and enjoy ourselves, go and follow our own hearts, then everything will be fine. Well, of course, sometimes it's not fine. Think again of the prodigal son, another powerful image that Jesus puts before us. Here was a, a young man eager to get away from home and all the restrictions of home life, going to go and find all sorts of beautiful women, all the pleasures of life. Six months later, he's feeding pigs, which is again a powerful image of what often happens to us when we just simply abandon ourselves to our own desires and passions. We end up not as happy as we thought we would be. We may even end up, as many people do these days, in some form of addiction either to alcohol or food or gambling or pornography or whatever it might be. And so it's much better to turn to Jesus and take his yoke upon us because it's not burdensome. In fact, it's very joyful, just like the, the wings of a bird are not a burden to the bird, but they help the bird to soar above and fly. And Jesus tells us something very wonderful about himself in this passage. He tells us that he is humble and gentle. And he gives another image, or rather the first reading gave us another image, which may not be immediately apparent. It talks about the king, obviously we see it as a prophecy of Jesus fulfilled on Palm Sunday, coming on and riding, not on a horse, but on a colt. Or as one translation puts it, on, riding on an ass, a very humble sort of beast of burden. And again, the image here is very powerful. Who rides on horses or powerful kings, Roman emperors? Even seeing the policemen on horses in uh, Hyde Park, and they're a little bit intimidating. You're not quite sure if the horse is going to kick you or the policeman's going to charge you. But Jesus is not that kind of a king. He doesn't dominate us or do violence to our nature. He is humble. The image there is kind of suggestive of the early kings of Israel who were just ordinary people brought from out of the people themselves, not anything special. They rode not on horses but on, on donkeys, basically. And Jesus tells us he is that kind of a king. Humble. He is one of us. He is our brother as well as our Lord and our King. And he tells us the secret of how he's able to do this by revealing to us that he is in this unique relationship with God the Father. Everything has been entrusted to me by my Father, he says. I came not to do my own will, but to do the will of God my Father. And that's what makes me humble and gentle. That's what makes me able to offer you this easy burden, this light yoke. A wonderful secret that we find that if we set ourselves to do God's will rather than our own, surprisingly, it's actually much easier and much more joyful. It's true that Jesus does make demands of us. Sometimes he asks a lot of us, but in return, he gives a great deal more 